It was Wednesday evening when I first thought that my world, my safe and sane world, was not what I thought it was. I returned from work a little early. I heard my wife, Marge, walking around our upstairs bedroom and decided to go up and say hello. As I walked down the corridor, I heard her talking to someone on the phone. As I got closer, I heard her side of the conversation. Yeah, honey, today was great. I really enjoyed it. What? Since when does she like her job? Our bedroom door was ajar and I looked inside. She was undressing while talking on her cell phone. She took off her skirt and put it on the bed. I noticed she was wearing black lace panties, which I had never seen before. I was about to go in, but then she said, I need to go. He might be home soon, and I need to take a shower. We'll talk tomorrow. Bye, handsome. She put the phone on the charger and took off her blouse. She was wearing a black lace bra. With her back to me, she took off her underwear and threw it into the laundry basket. As she walked around the bed to go to the shower, she passed the mirror. Being a woman, of course, she should have stopped and looked. From my spot in the corner of the door, I had a perfect view of her reflection in the mirror. What I saw gave me chills. In the mirror, a mark was clearly visible on her left breast. My wife had a bruise on her chest, and I didn't leave it. I heard her gasp and realized that she had seen what I had just seen. She followed. Damn, she growled. Now I have a trail to cover. Oh my God. She walked into the bathroom and turned on the shower, and I stood outside our bedroom, crying and shaking. My name is David Atkinson. Marge has been my wife for 23 years. We have two children, Julia, who is 19, and Tom, who is 18. Marge works part-time in the acquisition department at an Air National Guard base. I'm a chemical engineer. Until a few minutes ago, I thought we had a wonderful marriage and a wonderful life. Now it looked like my wife needed someone else to make her life wonderful. After a while, I calmed down a little and, entering our bedroom, I took Marge's cell phone to find the last call number. I was surprised she had a password on her mobile phone. We never used passwords and sometimes made calls from each other's phones. I realized I hadn't used her phone in a couple of months. It was just never comfortable. I took her blouse and smelled it. There was a faint shaving mark on her that I didn't recognize. After some thought, I pulled out the DVR from the kitchen and a Ziploc bag. Back in the bedroom, I put my underwear in a Ziploc bag and stuffed it in my pocket. I reminded myself to order an organic detection kit and send it to work. The DVR was placed on the chest of drawers, aimed at the mirror. I set it up to record and wrapped one of my ties around it. It was almost hidden. As I was walking downstairs, I noticed her laptop screen was lit up, so I decided it would be a good time to check her email. Bad luck. She set a password for it, too. We also never used passwords on our computers, which was further proof. Then I left. I really wanted to confront her, but I was emotionally torn. Besides, I had no real proof. She could simply deny everything. No, I needed ironclad proof and I wanted to find out who she was cheating on me with, so that I could harm him in return. I called my wife's cell phone, knowing she was still in the shower, and told her I was stuck at work and would have a late dinner when I finished. After hiding the evidence in the garage, I headed to the nearest bar to think and suffer. It was a quiet, run-down bar with a dingy motel next to it. There was nothing special here, average food, cheap drinks, and privacy. Upon entering the bar, I noticed that they had a new bartender. Great, I thought. I hope she knows how to make a gin and tonic. It turned out that he could. Her name was Mary. She just started working, and I liked talking to her. She was a divorced mom trying to make ends meet in life. I got home around 11,000 p.m. The house was quiet. Everyone had already gone to bed. I went up to the bedroom to undress. As I was changing into my robe, Marge said, You're late today, honey. Turning to her, I replied, Sorry to wake you. It's been a long day. Then he added, 
but I will compensate you if you feel left out. She sighed and said, Oh, I'm too tired right now, maybe for the next couple of days. It's agreed, dear. I'll rest a little and go to bed too. Good night, I replied. Nights. Taking the recorder, I left the bedroom and went down to the computer. As I connected the camera to the laptop, I realized that our lovemaking had dwindled over the last few months from two or three times a week to once a week, and that for the last month or so it had been on Saturday nights. I fast-forwarded until the bathroom door opened. She immediately went to the mirror and examined her breasts. I could clearly see the bruise. She pulled out some flannel pajamas for later. She usually sleeps naked. I saved the video and cleared the camera. After I put it away, I went to bed. Along the way, I raised the thermostat temperature about four degrees. Let's see how she likes sleeping in flannel. Marge was either asleep or pretending to be asleep when I got into bed. On Thursday morning, I got up early to get away from her. I didn't think I could hide my anger, and I needed time to calm down and plan my next steps. I called work and said that I would only be there after lunch. Then I called my friend, George. I knew George could help. We had been good friends for many years, and when he found out his wife was cheating on him, he went through a messy divorce. We spent a lot of time together, drowning in his sadness. George is now a major in the Air National Guard. After the divorce, he went deeper into work and received several promotions. The latter put him in charge of base security. On the second ring, he picked up and said, Hey, buddy, how are you? Not very good right now, I replied. I need your help. I think Marge is cheating on me. Oh my gosh, David, I'm so sorry, he said. I will do everything I can to help. Can you come here this morning? Yes, I replied. How about I come over now? Sounds good, George said quietly. I hope you're wrong, but I've never noticed you overthinking the situation. I don't think I'm wrong, but with your help, I should be able to prove it one way or another. As soon as I arrived there, we sat on the couch and discussed my suspicions. When I left an hour later, I already had part of the plan, and I borrowed five digital audio recorders from George, the same ones he used to catch his wife. I am back. Marge's car has already left. I placed four recorders around the house, leaving the last one for her car. Then I noticed that the house was a little cooler than usual. Checking the thermostat, I saw that she had lowered the temperature. I assumed she had a hot night. Deciding to look around a little, I began to carefully check her closet. The first thing I noticed was that there were several outfits that I had not seen before. They were more daring than usual. Perhaps she bought them, but then didn't feel comfortable wearing them in public, I thought. Then, in the back of the drawer, I found several sets of underwear that I had never seen before. They were worn out. A couple of them were torn. Torn in the sense that someone tore them off Marge to get to her naked body. It hurts, and I just stare at them for many minutes. Finally, I went to work. Around three o'clock, I called Marge on her cell phone and left a voicemail that I was stuck at work and wouldn't be home until late that evening. As soon as I got home that evening, I installed the last voice recorder in Marge's car and then went to bed. I made sure I went to bed much later than Marge on Friday night, too. She was either asleep or pretending. I checked the audio recorders on Friday night, but didn't hear anything interesting. As usual, I quietly made the kids breakfast over the weekend. Marge sleeps longer on Saturday. On Sunday, I. After they finished and went to watch TV, I cleaned up the kitchen and put Marge's breakfast in the microwave. I connected the LAN cable to my laptop, logged into my computer, into the wireless router, and turned off the wireless access. I then left Marge a note pointing out the microwave and told her I would be outside while I went out to start cleaning the backyard. About two hours later, Marge came outside and complained that her laptop couldn't connect to the Internet. We went inside. I tried my laptop and said, Hmm, mine connects. Let's see yours. She seemed a little nervous and hovered around her laptop and me. 
I pretended to fix the problem, and she eventually got tired and left, but came back every five minutes or so. While she was not around, I inserted a flash drive and installed a program to intercept the keys. The next time she left, I set it up to capture all keystrokes, take screenshots twice a minute, monitor all sites visited, and intercept her email, including deleted and sent messages. The next time she left, I went back to my laptop and turned the wireless service back on. I checked that her laptop was now connecting and went to look for her. After I showed her that it was connecting to the internet, I told her that the hard drive was very fragmented. I called up the cleaning program and suggested that when she was done for the day, she would press that button and let the program run all night. This will also give my key hooking program time to pass all the data to me. She put her arms around my neck, kissed me, and, smiling seductively, said, Thank you, big guy. How can I repay you for your services? I smiled back, patted her lightly on the butt, and said, How about you wash my car? Her face showed that she expected a completely different answer. I kissed her on the cheek and said, Just kidding. Walking away, I added, I need to get back to work there. She looked confused as I left the room. While I was mowing the grass, I realized that I was being stupid. I wasn't going to have sex with her tonight, but I didn't need to let her think I was suspicious of her until I had real proof. I needed to act normal for now. I decided to work like hell here today so that I'll be too tired for sex tonight. We watched a couple of movies with the kids in the evening. Marge snuggled up to me and felt good. She was in the mood for pranks. We took a break towards the end of the second film. I took the opportunity to grab a drink and take one of Marge's Xanax pills. I expected to fall asleep in 45 minutes. About 15 minutes later, Marge woke me up. I announced that I had worked too much today and was going to bed. Marge looked disappointed, especially when the kids asked her to stay for the third movie. I don't know when she came to bed. I was asleep. Sunday was my sleep day, but I woke up at 5 a.m. I didn't want to be in bed when Marge woke up in case she wanted morning sex, and it's time to start checking her background. I turned off her alarm as I left. When I turned on the computer, I realized that if I didn't have sex with her tonight, she would definitely suspect something was wrong. I ran the keyboard log reader. While it was initializing, I added a password to my computer. There were about 500 emails in a hidden folder, so I started reading them. The keylogger sent old emails first, and I looked at emails from six months ago. I saw two letters from someone named Will Perez. It had its own domain name, but the messages were about her work. Maybe this guy worked with her, or maybe this is the guy. I sorted by name and found one email about four months ago with the subject line, Hey, hot stuff. I read it. It wasn't overtly lecherous, but it sounded like this guy was trying to seduce her. He registered his name as an internet domain. A quick check showed that it doesn't have a web page. I sorted by date and found six letters from old Willie dated yesterday. No wonder Marge was so concerned about her laptop. She was afraid that I might open Outlook. I open the newest letter and read, starting at the bottom where she complained to him about the marks he left on her and how difficult it was to hide it from me. His response was basically, it happens, forget about it, and to hell with your husband. Her furious response was sent 14 minutes later. One paragraph was interesting. She wrote, I know you don't love your wife, but I love my husband. I don't want to hurt him or ruin our marriage. It's bad enough that I rarely let him have sex with me lately. Now, when you leave marks on me, I can't even let him see me naked. I won't date you this Wednesday. Interesting, but it didn't change anything. The next two letters were from him with a changed tone. He asked for forgiveness, said that he would always be more careful in the future. He offered to take her on a trip somewhere to the warm seas if she could get away for a while. He admitted his love for her. Oh God, he sounded like a teenager. The last one was from her, saying that she was glad that he now understood her position. 
she will go on trips only with her husband and will not meet him this Wednesday. She added that she expected the marks to heal in a week, and then she would be busy making amends to her husband. Other letters provided more information. They had sex for about two months. They met at a local motel where his company kept a room for rent, ostensibly for his long-distance salesman to stay there when needed. One letter gave her directions to the location, saying the company had rented room 187 for two years. This was the motel across from the bar I was at the other day. Then a new letter arrived from him. It was in response to the letter she sent last night, and I was shocked again. She wrote to him that she couldn't do without him this week and that they would meet on Wednesday at 13. She insisted that he be more careful this time. His response was full of enthusiasm about how wonderful she was and how he would do everything wonderful for her. I decided right then and there that they would both pay for their actions. I needed to plan some activities, and I would need George's help. I forwarded the most helpful emails to George and started preparing breakfast. Marge came down around 9.30 and thanked me for letting her sleep in the morning. I said it was only fair since I fell asleep so early last night. She hugged me and whispered, Don't work too hard today, honey. I need you to work hard tonight. I ignored the second part and said, I'm almost done there, only a couple of hours of work left. I walked away saying, I better get back to work. As I was leaving, I looked back and saw a worried look on her face. She quickly changed her expression when she saw me looking at her. I said, Scream if you need anything, darling. She answered weakly, Okay. I was cleaning out the garage when George called. First he asked if I could talk now. I went outside and told him yes. He said, I have read the letters. I am so sorry. Thank you, I said. I feel bad, but at least now I know. You know, and you have some evidence, but it has not yet been proven in court, he noted. I replied, I know. Maybe I can take some photos of her entering or leaving the motel. We can do a lot more if you want. You just can't use the evidence in court, he said. Tell me. I conducted several criminal investigations at that motel over the years. The owner is a nice guy who doesn't want criminals or drug addicts hanging out there. I can call him tomorrow and get the key to that room from him as part of my ongoing investigation, he replied. We'll have to find out when Perez won't be there, and then we can set up the same hidden cameras I used to catch my sneaky ex, he explained. I firmly said, yes, I want to do this, not just to catch her, but because I want to get to him. Can you also see what you can find on him? I'll start doing this first thing Monday morning. Let's see if we can install the equipment on Monday or Tuesday. We'll need maybe an hour, he replied. We talked for a few more minutes. George explained that the equipment is triggered by sound and movement and will transmit data to a receiver, which must be within 30 meters. He intended to place the receiver in a service room somewhere. When I need to retrieve the data, I simply need to drive to the motel and activate the receiver in my car. The first receiver was also a transmitter. On my signal, he will upload his data to me and then clear his memory. It may take up to two hours to send the entire day's data. The rest of Sunday passed without incident. I found myself really looking forward to sex tonight. I came to the conclusion that even though Perez had tarnished it, there was no reason why I couldn't still just use it. Marge whispered, David, I love you. She then burst our bubble by adding, You're the only man in the whole world for me. I kissed her a few times before standing up and saying, I'm going to go wash up. Rest, baby. When I walked into the bathroom, I was furious. How could she say that? Knowing that Perez was also in her world, how could she, after the most tender love in a long time, lie in our marital bed, a conscious lie she chose to tell? When I emerged from the bathroom, I was pleased to find that Marge was already snoring lightly. I carefully lay down on the bed. Monday morning, I woke up early and noticed that Marge had put on her flannel pajamas sometime during the night. 
I left the house before anyone woke up. I called the office on Monday morning, told him I wouldn't be there today, and went to see George. He told me he called the motel manager and got some information. It turns out that our lover got involved with several women at once in his love nest. I'm sure he thinks he's smart for having a regular number to use, but he's dumb for using the same room. George also said the manager thought Perez was a jerk who harassed staff. The latest information was that Perez works in the room a couple of days a week, but is rarely there before 11 a.m. Well, let's take our things and go, said George. We loaded the equipment into George's van and pulled up to the motel ten minutes later. George knocked on the manager's door and introduced me as someone working with him on the investigation and noted that I would appear occasionally. The manager, whose name was Kevin, said that it would be fine and that he did not want any illegal activity at the motel. He gave George the key to the room and showed us its location on the room map. We saw that there was a service room nearby about 15 meters away. George asked for the key, which Kevin immediately printed. Finally, Kevin called Perez's room to make sure he wasn't there. There was no answer. We thanked Kevin and drove the van up to our room. George knocked on the door a couple of times and then let us in with a key. The room was empty. I stopped, suddenly looking at the bed where my wife was cheating on me. After a while, I turned around and started helping. In less than two hours, the equipment was installed and tested. As we were leaving, I noticed a laptop station on the table. Look, George, he must be using his laptop here, I exclaimed. If I can get here while he's here and gone, I can install spyware on him. George replied, he probably leaves it here when he goes out for lunch or dinner. I'll wait here every day if necessary, I replied. First, I want to install a GPS on his car so we won't be caught by surprise. Let's not rush, he replied. Understood. I don't want to risk revenge. Let's get out of here. I'll treat you to lunch. How about eating across the street? Their food is pretty good. Oh, and they have a new bartender. She's nice and easy to talk to. It sounds good. I'm hungry said George. When we entered the bar, it was empty. I went in first. Mary saw me, smiled, and waved. Then George came in behind me. Mary's face changed in surprise. She threw down the towel she was using to wipe the bar and immediately came over to us. Ignoring me, she threw her arms around George, saying, George, it's so great to see you again. He hugged her back warmly and said, Mary, I was wondering. It looks like you're back on your feet. I'm so happy for you. She pulled away, still holding him, and said, No, I'm not there yet, but I'm getting closer. Thank you. From the side I said, Um, Mary, I'd like to introduce you to my good friend, George. They both laughed. Mary let go of George and put both hands on my arm, saying, I liked you from the first time we met. Now that I know you're George's friend, it means a lot to me. I smiled and said, He's kind of a jerk, but overall he's a normal guy. She smiled and said, George and I have known each other for a couple of years, but I never thought of him as a jerk. It's probably a man thing. Mary continued serving drink orders for four other customers, but always came back to talk to us when she was done. Among other things, I learned that she was working as hard as she could to raise money for medical school in about five months. Around two o'clock in the afternoon, George and I were the only customers. I noticed this, and Mary said it was always empty during the day. She added, I don't earn tips, which is bad, but I usually use that time to study. Then, smiling at us, she concluded, But it's much nicer to talk to you guys. We talked for another hour and a half when suddenly Mary, looking quite serious, turned to George and said, George, I'll tell him. George simply returned her gaze and nodded slowly. She turned to me and said, If we're going to be friends, I don't want to have secrets, and perhaps after I tell you, you will want to not consider me your friend. I'll understand that. 
but I don't want to hide my life from you, and I don't want you to learn this from someone else. I saw her grab George's hand. She squeezed him tightly and said, Let me tell you how I met George. This scoundrel arrested me. He took me to a dirty cell in some cold dungeon that he has at his base. I broke down when I saw the camera. He didn't care. He just pushed me in there and started closing the door. Then he stopped and saw me crying. He started yelling at me, telling me how I was ruining my life and how stupid I was. He said I was hurting myself. No one had told me this before, but I heard it then, and everything came out of me. I collapsed on this terrible dirty mattress and cried like a child. George sat down next to me and said one word. She looked at me with tears in her eyes and continued. He asked me, why? He didn't say anything else. Looking at George, she continued, For the first and only time in my life, I gave it all. Crying, sometimes hysterical, I told him everything. I don't know how long it took. George sat there with me. When I finally finished, he just stared at me for a long time. Then he stood up, lightly squeezed my shoulder, and then locked me in this cell. He left me there for fourteen hours. Didn't see anyone, didn't hear anything. Finally, he came back and told me it was time to see the judge. The lawyer didn't say a word. The judge was about to sentence me to prison when suddenly George stood up and asked for it. I will never forget what he said and what he looked like in his full uniform. I can still quote him verbatim, but the important thing is that he told the judge that justice would not be served if he sent me to prison. He wanted me to go to rehab. The judge and lawyer looked shocked which is understandable since I was a three-time loser and clearly guilty of the crimes George was accused of. And suddenly cool George took my side. After some hesitation, the judge gave me a chance of 90 days of rehabilitation, and if I failed, four years of hard labor. I grabbed him. Looking back at George, she said, Ever since George arrested me, I haven't fallen again. Stepping back and looking at both of us, she added softly, George, David, I don't walk the streets anymore, but I'm still a slut. This is the only way I can raise money for school and provide for my daughter. But if you two don't want to talk to me anymore, I'll understand. I'm sorry, George. She found herself being hugged by both sides. George said, As long as you keep fighting, I'm on your side. And you will succeed, I know it. I added, Mary, I'm glad we met and I'm glad to think of you as my friend. It was good that the bar was empty and we were in a dark corner. Mary just held us and cried. On Monday evening, Marge returned around 5.30 with Chinese dinner. She came over to kiss me, but I just took the bags and carried them to the table, saying, Great, we're all hungry. When I turned around, she was looking at me with a thoughtful look. I said, why don't you change in the bathroom while I get everything ready for dinner? Her face turned pale as I turned away and began taking plates out of the cabinet. Whatever she was about to say got stuck in her throat. Dinner passed quietly. The children noticed, but said nothing. Marge wasn't too hungry, but I made it a point to eat a lot. Marge tried to start a conversation several times, but I mostly ignored her. Then I realized I was being stupid and giving away my cards. Sex last night was just normal for me, but I made it special for her, and she probably still felt good about it. My behavior now was simply cheap, and I didn't want her to call it quits before I had proof. I pretended to shake off my thoughts and said, Sorry, that's it. I got distracted by a problem at work and brought it home. Let's start from the beginning. How was your day? We chatted during dinner with a semblance of normalcy. I tried to smile at Marge a couple of times and be attentive to her. Marge went to bed before me. I raised the thermostat about five degrees. After an hour of waiting, I checked the voice recorders, but again found nothing interesting. I went into our bedroom. It must have been about 25 degrees Celsius there. I got ready for bed lay down in bed and turned away from her without saying a word. She said quietly, Good night, dear. Without turning around, I said, Why are you wearing that flannel sweater? It's not cold here at all. 
She was silent for a minute and then said, Honey, I'm just cold, that's all. I decided to insist. I turned to her and hugged her. She returned the hug. She was really sweaty. You feel bad? I asked with concern. She replied, I don't think so. I've just been feeling cold at night lately. I reached out my hand to her untouched breast and, stroking it, said, I know a couple of ways to warm you up. She stiffened, sighed and said, David, I'm sorry, I'm just too tired. I turned away and said, okay. Marge snuggled up and cuddled up to me, saying, Honey, yesterday was absolutely wonderful, but today I'm too tired. Listen, I have an easy day on Wednesday. I'll have a blast on Wednesday night. I just muttered in response, okay. After a few seconds, she pulled away and returned to her side of the bed. Tuesday morning dawned cool. I left at the usual time and went to work. George called to say that he had installed a GPS on Perez's car the night before and had given me the website and login information. I checked the site. It showed that he was in another part of the city. Deciding it was time to check the voice recorder in the bedroom, I told the office that I would be back in a couple of hours and drove home. Marge called her best friend Ashley on Monday morning. Almost immediately, Marge told her that she had incredible sex that weekend. Ashley exclaimed, Did you see Will this weekend? So Ashley knew. I wonder if her husband Mike knew and didn't tell me, creep. No, no, with David, it was Sunday evening. I wanted to have sex with him on Saturday night like usual, but he had been working in the yard all day and was too tired, Marge replied. She continued, But Sunday night was amazing. It was absolutely the best sex I've had in years. What was different than usual? Ashley asked. She thought for a moment. Don't know. We didn't do anything new. Also, David gave me a wonderful massage, and he used his fingers a little more. His touch was perfect. Ashley said, Wow, better than sex with Will? Oh yeah, making love with David is always better. It was super better this time. Marge replied. Then why are you having fun with Will? Ashley asked with a smile in her voice. That's different, Marge replied. David makes me love. I feel so protected with him. Will is just sex. It's nice, but I would never want David to treat me like that. But both are good. I know that doesn't make sense, right? It makes sense to me, friend. It's excitement, raw passion. Oh, I know. That's why I started dating Brian Sears last year. Your mother, Ashley, is also a cheater. Should I tell Mike and risk ruining his life? It would be wrong. Then I remembered that I thought he might be a scoundrel for knowing and not telling me. He would want to know, as would I. I'll give him a copy of this tape after I deal with Perez. Ashley's next call was earlier this morning. Their conversation had a different tone compared to Monday. Marge called and said, Hi, Ashley. Ashley sensed Marge's tone and asked what was wrong. David noticed that I wore flannel sweaters and closed the bathroom door when I changed clothes. He asked me about this when he got into bed. I told him I was just cold, but Ashley, the room was hot as hell. I was sweating all night in these heavy flannel sweaters. I don't think he believed me, but he didn't say anything else. Then David wanted to have sex, but I couldn't risk him seeing the bruise. On Sunday, I took out the night light, but David fixed it, so I said no again. He was upset. I tried to make up for it by saying I'd take it off on Wednesday, but he didn't seem too happy about it. We were lying down, and there was a wall between us. And the worst part is that I kept thinking about Will, not David. I closed this file and saved it. I didn't need to listen anymore. After browsing the internet, I ordered an organic detection kit and sent it to my office. Then I went to the motel. Perez's car was at his room, but it was lunchtime. I went to the bar. Mary wasn't working, but I saw from the window that Perez was sitting in a booth, looking at the menu. I decided now is the time. I walked up to his motel room door and knocked. Without waiting for an answer, 
I used the key to open the door. This time I ignored the bed and walked into the other room, where I saw Perez's laptop turned on with the QuickBooks screen open. I took out my flash drive, inserted it into the computer, and installed the Keylogger program. This time I didn't take screenshots, but I checked all emails, all websites, all keystrokes, and all data, including accounting data. If he was doing something that I could use to hurt him, I would find it. I then activated his remote desktop client and made sure the correct port was open on the motel network. It was like that. Finally, I went to one of the sites offering a free lightweight version of the remote control program and created an account under its domain name. I installed their software that would allow me to control his laptop from anywhere, and I could see his desktop on my monitor. The site records the IP addresses of everyone who logs in, so it will show that it was installed from the motel network. I removed icons from the desktop and system tray, as well as from the start menu. I then returned to the QuickBooks screen and exited from there. I went back to the office and worked for a few hours. Coming home in a good mood, I was cheerful and helped the children and Marge. She looked worried when I came in, but was relieved to see that I was acting normal. Around 10, she said it was time for her to go to bed. I told her that I needed to finish work and would be there later. She replied, Great, see you in the morning. Yes, just wonderful, I thought. Get enough sleep so that you can service your lover tomorrow. I had a lot of data to sort through. Today's recordings, all the files from the bugs, all the files from Willie and Marge's computers, data from the phone wiretap. But it's not tonight. I downloaded the data from the dash cam in Marge's car and put it back in her car. She was either asleep or pretending to be asleep when I got into bed. I settled as far away from her as possible and fell asleep, thinking about tomorrow. Marge was up before me on Wednesday morning, which worked to my advantage. I was sick of the thought that she would cheat on me again today, and I would have to watch a tape of her pleasuring her lover and receiving it in return. When I entered the kitchen, she was already finishing preparing breakfast. I noticed that she was fully dressed for work, which was new. She said, You're just in time, darling. Good morning. I muttered something in response and took a cup of coffee. After a couple of sips, I turned to her to find her looking at me with a puzzled look. I said, Sorry, I'm still sleeping. She said, Okay, you're usually so cheerful in the morning. Now you know how I feel in the morning. I didn't answer, just sat down and took a sip. The children came in and she began serving breakfast. I always help her serve when she cooks, but today I didn't. I didn't look at her, but I saw from the corner of my eye how she kept throwing quick glances at my face. As she placed the plate in front of me, she paused and stared at me. I pretended not to notice, looking at the door. As I was about to leave, she stood in front of me with a worried look and quietly said, David, is something wrong? I looked at her without expression and said, I don't know. I hugged her, suddenly affectionately. She melted in my arms, saying with relief, I'm glad, I was worried. I said, I love you and I can't imagine life without you and there is no other woman in this world with whom I would like to make love. I waited and then added, I hope you feel the same way about me. She immediately hardened and, sobbing, hugged me tightly, saying, Of course. She then whispered, And I plan to wear you out tonight. I pulled away abruptly and walked out without looking back. I drove to the motel and downloaded the data while I waited for Marge to go to work. I got home a little after 9 a.m. I spent the entire time in the parking lot wondering how I was going to get through this day. How can I behave normally with this traitor? What should I do? How can I watch a video of her with another man? Downloading data from the bugs took some time. I wandered around the house aimlessly while they copied. There's no way I'll be able to have a normal conversation with Marge tonight, much less get into bed with her. I started with his emails. After a couple of hours, I learned a few basic facts. 
he had three companies that bought products cheap and resold them to a local military base, several Fortune 500 companies, and the federal government. Looks like he cheated on five women besides my wife, that busy scoundrel. He had numerous emails regarding product quality and specifications. I saved a couple of letters for later study. Nothing special yet, but it was a start. I then copied his three companies' QuickBooks files and used a keylogger program to find his logins and passwords. There was nothing particularly useful there either. I'm not an accountant. I noticed that he had six corporate credit cards in his expenses section. He even included each card number in the notes for each card. Listening to his phone conversations took a lot of time, but it turned out to be very useful. I started to see a connection between some of the emails and what he was saying on the phone. One call was from someone in the base shipping and receiving department. He said he was having trouble processing the latest shipment due to duplicate serial numbers. What's worse is that all future shipments must have unique serial numbers. Perez was annoyed by this and made it clear that he did not like it. The interviewee insisted that the new audit software would capture all sorts of things and that they needed to be careful. When Perez hung up, he went online and ordered two specialized printers and supplies. Another call was from a supplier who wanted Perez to buy from him. After much prevarication, Perez finally said, Listen, the qualification process takes forever. That's how it works. But I like you and I want to help. The chief purchasing officer on base is the guy who approves suppliers, but he listens to his purchasing agent. I can get him to help you, but it will cost money. The interviewer seemed beaten when he asked, How much will it cost? For $5,000 cash, you can sell $100,000 worth of goods to the base, and to help you out, you can raise your price by 2% no problem. Future orders will not cost as much, Perez replied. The interlocutor sounded somewhat happier. Okay, how will I give you the money? Let me know when you have everything ready. I'll tell you where to meet. In two days your proposal will be accepted, Perez replied. Thank you. I'll call as soon as I can. The next call was from a guy in the purchasing department of the base where Marge worked. He told Perez the bid sizes from several competitors for several contracts. In addition, he received four interesting calls, all from his mistresses. One of the calls was from my wife. It was the same conversation that I heard from the dash cam in the car. Taking a break, I decided it was time to organize the information a little more so I created folders for Marge and Will on the flash drive and subfolders for video, audio, data, and more. I moved everything I had there and made a backup. It's time to call George. He sympathized with me for a few minutes and then I told him that I needed his official help. He listened. When I finished, he said, great, although I cannot use your evidence in court, it will informally make my investigation easier. We have been investigating the situation with deliveries and reception at the base for several months now. Inventory goes missing, sometimes entire lots. Documentation shows nothing unusual, but physical inventories show duplicate serial numbers and below-spec materials. I need to see what you have as soon as possible. I said, I must leave the house before she comes. I can meet you this afternoon in your office. He said, no, let's meet at my house at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I don't want to involve anyone else yet. Dinner and drinks are at my expense, and will drown our sorrows a little. I'm driving. You're drinking, George said firmly. I agreed, and we immediately ended the conversation. Here is the answer. I'll spend the evening with George and do something stupid. By the time I get home, Marge will be asleep and in the morning I can use the hangover as an excuse to stay away from her. Suddenly I shuddered. It was almost one o'clock in the afternoon. She will be with him soon. I called Marge's cell phone and it went to voicemail. Apparently she didn't want to talk to me now. I left her a message that I was going to George's and would be back late. As a result, I returned to work, starting to watch video files from Monday until this morning. 
The first surprise awaited me there. Early Monday, a woman entered using her card. That idiot immediately stood up from his desk, hugged her, and kissed her passionately. They retired to the bed for fun. I saved the file. On Tuesday morning, he slept with the maid. On Tuesday afternoon, another maid knocked on his door. I copied the scenes for later use. It was time to meet George, so I made another full backup, creating an extra one for George. George picked me up, and we spent about two hours discussing my findings and then headed to the bar. It was about one in the morning when we left, but that's all I remember. Thursday morning, I woke up around nine. The house was empty, Marge and the children were gone. There was a note on the table. It read, because you were so drunk last night. You didn't set your alarm. I'm not your alarm clock. I laughed, thinking. She, she's so angry. Great. I won't have to run away from her. I then called the office to report that I was sick. After that, I drove to the motel to get the video I was afraid to see. On the way back, George called, saying that the investigation was now in full swing. The man who took the dollar five thousand bribe agreed to wear the bug. The methods by which Perez and his friends stole were revealed, and a preliminary report was sent to base command. Military police were expected to search Perez's office, motel room, and home. His computers will be thoroughly checked, and there better be no keyloggers sending data to me. I assured him that there would be none. George hoped that the search would take place in about ten days and hoped that I could avoid confrontation with Marge until then. He then added another detail. Since the leak to Perez had come from the purchasing department, Marge was now considered a person of interest. I was about to say, that was stupid. Marge doesn't steal. But then I realized that I had also thought that Marge would never cheat on me. We promised to talk tomorrow. I arrived home and downloaded the data from the motel as well as from my home computer. Then I started looking at the Wednesday data until 12.30, but then I stopped. Next, I checked his email and found emails that appeared to be from two other suppliers who had bribed Perez. I forwarded them to George. I found several letters from his girlfriends. Some of them indicated dates and times when he would have them. I noted these points because Perez would be too busy to notice that I was taking control of his computer. Finally, the time has come. I couldn't put off watching Marge's video any longer. I fast-forwarded until he came to the door and my wife walked into the room. I finally started playback and watched them hug and kiss passionately. Besides how she reminded him to be gentle, they didn't say much as they undressed each other and rolled around on the bed. Thursday evening was quiet. The kids were out. Marge and I were going about our business without much communication. After everyone went to bed, I replaced the data recorder in her car and copied it. I couldn't resist checking the data from the machine. I was sure she was talking to Ashley on the way to work. Marge wouldn't call from the house phone in the bedroom because I was hungover and sleeping there and she wouldn't ring the bell in the kitchen because the children could come in at any moment. Sure enough, Ashley called Marge, asking how it went. Marge said, Will was fine. I forced him to be more gentle. He's still a bit rough, but he enjoys hanging out with me. What about David? asked Tycho Ashley. Marge sobbed. Nothing. He went to get drunk with one of his friends. He came home late, stank of alcohol, and fell into bed without saying a word to me. What were you doing? What could I do? I lay there seething with anger while he snored. In the morning, I turned off his alarm, wrote a sarcastic note, and left. Ashley noted, You know, sometimes, every now and then, a lot of us go out and get drunk. It seems like it was the wrong time. No, Marge sobbed again. I hinted at him about sex several times last night. Yesterday morning, I told him I was going to wear him out tonight. He didn't say anything, just went to work. He didn't even say goodbye. Do you think he suspects something or knows something? Ashley asked. Marge said, No, how could he? I meet Will when David is at work. 
No, I think David is angry that we've been having sex once a week for a while now, and he's trying to get revenge by neglecting me. That's a far-reaching assumption, my dear. I saved this conversation, thinking, God, I made her angry, and I won't have to pay for it. Thursday night Marge made sexual advances, but I ignored them. It was almost two in the morning when I went to bed, and she was already asleep. Sorry, Ashley, you were wrong. I got up early on Friday and went straight to work. Left around three with the organic test kit and stopped at a motel to get the video for Thursday and today. Mary didn't work at the bar, but I had a drink while I waited for the data to load. When I got home, I started copying the files into their storage and then used the test kit. The results were positive, although it didn't change anything. I had plenty of time to watch the new videos and again I was shocked. I opened the first file. Mary went into his room. He gave her money and she had sex with him. There were two other interesting files both from this day, just a few hours ago, in fact. The first was a phone call from Marge asking her to come over. After a little play, Marge agreed. The latest files showed Marge walking in, hugging and kissing Perez, then kneeling in front of him. She left soon after. For no particular reason, I saved these three files for George. I called George and said that I needed to meet with him urgently. He agreed and offered to come directly to my home. But there was too little time before Marge returned, so I asked to meet at his office. Ten minutes later, he opened the door for me. I didn't go in, but I handed him the flash drive and said, George, there are three files on this drive. The first one is the most important. I'm sorry you have to watch this. I'll be waiting in the car when you're done. Almost an hour later, George opened the car door and sat in with me. Threading his seat belt, he said, To the bar, James. I don't need alcohol. I need answers, some from Mary. Mary was sitting at the bar, although she wasn't working. When she saw us, she waved at the bartender to give us a couple of gin and tonics. After he placed them in front of us, she hugged George and squeezed my hand before saying, Hey guys, always nice to see you. I thoughtlessly said, Hi Mary, nice to see you. George looked at her and said, Mary, what happened? Her face scrunched up and she replied, George, you were right, as always. I contracted sexually transmitted diseases. This is why I can't work in a bar. I'm infected and don't want to risk infecting others. I don't worry about school anymore. I'll just cope as best I can without the nurse. My phrase, you will graduate, beat George's words. You will become a nurse by half a second. Mary simply lowered her head and replied, No, I can get by with this job if I don't have to save for school. That's enough for now. George grabbed her hand and blurted out, No, no, that's not even close to enough. You talked about becoming a nurse that day in your prison cell, and every day after that you worked towards that goal. I won't let you give up. I added, we'll find another way, Mary. She looked at both of us with tears in her eyes and said, I couldn't ask for better friends, but I cannot and will not ask you for help. That would be using our friendship. George and I looked at each other before I said, okay, you're not asking, and since you can't stop us, the topic is closed. We will contact you. We all laughed, and then I continued. George, I asked, aren't there going to be vacancies on the base soon? Before he could answer, Mary became serious again. Guys, she said, there are two more things I need to tell you. First, I know you follow Will Perez. I can see the door to his room through the front windows of the bar, and I hope you arrest him soon. George nodded with a straight face. The first thing I did when I found out about my illnesses was that I looked in to see him. I gasped and screamed, why? She growled at me, because it was the only way to hurt him. It was about midnight when I went to bed. Marge was asleep, and now George knew all my plans. He was also going to see if Mary could get a job in the base's purchasing department. Several places should become available there soon. 
Saturday passed quietly. Marge and I didn't talk much. We had a normal movie night, but when I arrived with the drinks, Marge was sitting in the center of the couch with Tom and Julia sitting on either side of her. Usually Marge and I sit next to each other and the kids sit next to us on the couch. I sat down in the chair, noticing that Tom and Julia looked uncomfortable while Marge looked smug. Marge went to bed early. I used this time to check the voice recorders, but found nothing. She had one letter from Perez thanking her for the visit on Friday and looking forward to next Wednesday. We didn't really talk on Sunday. We simply followed the inertia of ordinary life. I went to bed a little earlier than Marge and noticed that she was still going into the bathroom to change into her pajamas. She should have known that her lies and betrayals had us both of us into a downward spiral. She got into bed without a word, but roughly enough to make sure I was awake. I didn't say anything as she immediately turned away from me. This worked to my advantage. On Monday afternoon, George called and said they were planning to conduct the raid the following Monday morning. He added that he hoped I could leave Marge alone this week so as not to scare Perez off. I agreed again and said that I planned to tell Marge that I would be on a business trip from Wednesday to Sunday, but that I would actually get a motel room and work out the details that I had discussed with him. I then called Kevin at the motel and booked a room directly above Perez's for five days. Monday night at dinner, I told Marge and the kids that I had to leave on a business trip on Wednesday and would be back on Sunday. Julia and Tom expressed dissatisfaction. Marge showed no reaction. On Tuesday, Marge and I barely spoke. I packed my bag and put it in the car. After everyone went to bed, I checked the recorders. Only one conversation was interesting. It happened this morning between Marge and Ashley. Marge said, Ashley, that creep is ruining everything. Will or David? Ashley asked, confused. David, we've been arguing for days now or just ignoring each other. Last night he told me that he was leaving on a business trip on Wednesday morning and would not be back until Sunday. Again, I can't have them both in one day, damn it. Ashley said, Marge, you better take care of your husband's issues before you worry about your fantasies. This has gone on too long. Yes, Marge replied. But if David would stop being such a bastard, I would amaze him with my skills. I just don't understand why it has to be so difficult. Great, she's cheating and it's my fault. I saved the file anyway. I left early for work on Wednesday, but left around noon to check into a motel. I took the video receiver out of my car and installed it along with two laptops in the room. Over the next few days, I will have access to the live feed as well as the internet. Then I waited until 1 p.m., watching from the window. I saw Marge drive up and enter his room. She brought her laptop with her. I turned on the live feed and watched as she hugged and kissed him. She told him she needed to check her email first, then turned on her laptop and connected to the motel's internet. They both worked on their computers for about ten minutes. Once she told him she was done, he picked her up and carried her to the bed. I turned down the volume and remotely logged into Perez's computer and from there into Marge's laptop while they undressed each other. Then I got to work. They had sex, rough and passionate, for almost two hours and then fell asleep in each other's arms. They woke up around 5 p.m., which gave me four hours of access to their computers. When they started to wake up, I logged out, but continued to watch. She woke up first, looked around, saw the clock, and then saw him. She shook him, saying, Will, wake up, honey, we fell asleep. He snorted as he woke up and rolled over onto his back. He asked, What time is it? A little after five, I have to go. He yawned, me too. I promised my wife that I would take her out to dinner. She playfully hit him and said, Hey, I don't want to hear about it. I hear too much about your husband and children, don't forget, he said as he began to stand up. She grabbed him and said, Honey, I'm sorry I said that. I know we both have other lives and I love mine. 
Sometimes I just get jealous thinking about you and your wife. I know. Honey, this is hard for both of us, he added. I like to think that your body belongs only to me. She objected. This is not yours. I choose to share it with you, but I love my husband, and I'm going to make up for the last few weeks of neglecting him. I truly love my time with you. Please understand this, but I can't risk my marriage. He pulled away from her and said, Hey, I don't want my wife to find out either. Standing up, he added, Damn, my shoulders are burning. She screamed, Will, I'm sorry, I scratched you. God, I'm so sorry. Crap. He went to the bathroom and looked at his wounds in the mirror. Damn, you cut my back, bitch. I am so sorry, Marge sobbed. She jumped out of bed. I'm sorry. Marge moaned. I guess we can't contain our passion. Probably, he muttered. Let's get dressed. I need to go home. When they were ready, he kissed her cheek, grabbed her ass and said, Love, see you soon. She responded with a kiss and left. Looking out the window, I watched as she walked away from her lover to return to our house. Anyone watching her would have realized that she was very tired. Oh yes, she'll pay. Thursday and Friday, I alternated between my work and my projects. On Thursday afternoon, he received a call from Marge saying that it had been great, but that she couldn't see him anymore and that she was cutting off contact. They argued for a bit and then promised to talk again soon. Late Friday night, I made the final transfers between computers, sent a few emails, and then removed the keyloggers from Marge and Perez's laptops and cleared their logs. I accessed Marge's computer through Perez's computer, knowing that the login program would record that the IP address was from the motel. I have forwarded all active offers to Marge Perez. I returned home on Sunday afternoon. Nobody was home. I took four voice recorders and cleaned them without listening. George could take them and the recorder from her car now. Then I unpacked and poured myself a drink. Julia and Marge returned home soon after visiting the grocery store. Tom arrived while we were doing some shopping, and we had a quiet last evening. I was at work Monday morning when I received a call from our family doctor's office around 11 ozad. The secretary asked me to come immediately if possible, but it had to be today. I asked why, but she just said that the doctor wanted to talk to me. Dr. Benson picked up the phone and said, David, I really need you to come into the office as soon as possible. I need to run some tests. I replied, Doctor, I will come, but please tell me what caused this and why it is so urgent. I would prefer to speak in person. I need to know if I should go straight to the hospital for surgery or just update my will. Doctor, you leave me in limbo. He sighed and said, Okay, David, your wife came in this morning feeling sick. Tests showed that she has three sexually transmitted diseases. She told us that she didn't have sex with anyone other than you, so it's likely that you infected her and passed on the diseases to her. Doctor, I'll be right there. The usually friendly staff were not so when I arrived. A grim nurse led me into an office and took a blood sample. It was very painful, and I noticed that she was using a really big needle. An hour later, Dr. Ju Benson came in looking puzzled. He began to say, while still walking, David, you don't have any sexually transmitted diseases. I apologize for my words on the phone. I just assumed Marge was telling me the truth, but she wasn't. I understand. Doctor, I'm glad everything is clean with me. I added, Marge and I haven't had sex in a while. Now I know that she cheated on me. I'm sorry. Here is a copy of your test results. Right then my cell phone rang. It was my daughter. I said, Doctor, I'm sorry, but my daughter never calls during the day unless it's an emergency. He nodded as I picked up the phone to hear Julia sobbing into the phone. Honey, what happened? Dad? Mommy just told us that you cheated on her, and now you've given her a disease, she cried. How could you? Julia, I'm at the doctor's now. 
I don't have any sexually transmitted diseases, I told her quietly. Let me hand the phone to Dr. Benson so he can confirm this. After he did this, he returned the phone to me. Julia sobbed. Dad, I'm so sorry that I doubted you. I'm so sorry. Mom was just so cold and matter-of-fact when she said it that we just believed her. I understand, honey, it's okay, I told her. Now tell the truth to your brother, but please don't tell Mom we talked. I'll be home soon. When I approached the administrator to pay my share, she handed me some papers, saying, These are copies of your test results confirming that you are fine. Due to HIPAA rules, we cannot give you information about your wife's medical problems. Handing me some more papers, she added, But I must have made a mistake and accidentally gave you copies of her report, too. She looked into my eyes and smiled. I realized that Marge would not be well received in this office when she came in for treatment for her STDs. I thanked the woman and headed home for one last confrontation. Arriving home, I saw that Marge's parents were invited to this circus. I parked the car in the garage and went into the kitchen. I heard voices from the living room, talking and sobbing, but most of all I noticed my father-in-law. Tall and muscular, a former miner, he was always hard to miss. Now, standing there, flushed, looking at me with hatred, his hands clenched into fists, he caught my attention. It didn't help when he hissed. You little bastard. You cheated on my daughter and gave her a disease. I will grind you into powder. Estimating that I had about two seconds to avoid a serious beating, I walked up to him, put my face about six inches from his, and, looking him straight in the eyes, said, if I did that, you would be right, beating me, but I didn't do it. Confusion fought with anger. He looked at me until he finally asked, Tell me, fast. I gave him copies of the medical reports. He read them six times and then just stared at the pages as the crying in the living room intensified. Finally, he met my gaze and said, You are clean. My daughter contracted a sexually transmitted disease. But someone else gave it to her. She lied to me, and she cheated on you. I said, We've been having problems lately and haven't had sex in a while. This saved me from her illnesses. But you didn't know that. David, I'm sorry for what I said and for what I thought about you. It's okay. Thanks for listening. My marriage may be over. My life may be over. But I'm glad you were willing to listen. His eyes narrowed, and he said, Let's talk. I grabbed him by the shirt and pinned him to the tabletop. Now it was me who hissed at him. The conversation will take place on my terms. She's your daughter, but she's my wife, and she shouldn't have brought her parents or our children into this. But she did it. My daughter, Julia, called me in tears. I still don't know what my son is thinking. You're a witness here because your daughter got you and them into this but that's all. Looking down at him in rage, at this guy who could throw me over a wall, I added, I don't care what you hear. This concerns my family. You stay away from this. Understood. Quietly he said, Yes, I understand, David. I let him go and we went into the living room. Both Marge and her mother yelled at me. Tom sat in a chair and cried, Julia dodged her grandfather and clung to me, saying, Daddy, I love you. Tom followed a moment later. I found myself in a double hug while my mother-in-law cursed me and my wife cried. Julia touched the papers in my hand and, looking into my eyes, asked, Is this proof? I nodded. Julia took the papers and stepped back guiltily to read the medical reports. She pulled Tom by the hand and showed him the important lines. They exchanged glances and then both hugged me tighter than before. Mother Marge cursed again and then said, How can you two hug this traitor? He gave your mother the disease. Marge, lying on the sofa, cried harder. Julia pulled away and approached her grandmother. She knelt down in front of her and, looking into her eyes, presented both medical reports. A few moments later, my mother-in-law covered her face with her hands. Marge screamed. What? Why does everyone think so differently? 
Julia's face was indescribable as she stood up from her grandmother and knelt down in front of her mother. She showed both medical reports again, pointing to the lines that proved that I was clean and Marge was not. Marge's face paled as she realized the reports. Julia said, Mom, you lied to us. You cheated on your husband. You are a traitor. Marge gasped and swung her hand at Julia's face in retaliation. My daughter has quick reflexes. Her hand came up to block the blow. Now it was her turn to hiss. Mom, don't ever try to hit me again. You have lost this right. You are my mother and I love you. Standing up, she added, but you are a traitor. You tried to turn me and my brother against our dad to cover up your activities. I will never forgive this. She came back to me and I was hugged again by both of my children. Marge looked at the three of us and quickly found protection. Children, your father must have infected me two or three weeks ago, I'm sure by accident. He must have had symptoms long before me and went to some clinic for treatment. We haven't had sex for a long time. Although I asked David to make love to me, he refused. With puppy dog eyes, Marge looked at everyone except me and added, I haven't cheated on my husband and I never will. But he cheated and now he made me look like I did it. Please believe me. Since we met, I have not had sex with anyone other than my husband. Well, everyone except me and Marge now looked confused. I saw that Marge's father was again thinking about driving me into the floor like a nail. Time to take it to the final level. This is the last chance Marge can come clean, and maybe we can save our marriage. Ignoring everyone else, I stared at Marge and said, Marge, this is your last chance. I have proof. Please tell the truth, and maybe we can work this out. I hoped she would answer honestly, but she attacked like a bear. How dare you! You have no proof because I never cheated on you. You're lying to my family. You insult my virtue. Show us your evidence. Okay, I'll show you, I replied. Marge looked a little less confident as I pulled out my laptop, connected it to my home entertainment system, and quickly booted it up. As it loaded, I thought, well, the revenge I've been working on for the past weeks has already begun for Perez. Now it was about to begin for Marge. I didn't expect four innocent people to be involved, but here they are. The first thing I did last Wednesday while Marge was busy with Perez was use one of his company's credit cards to register a domain name and open a web hosting account. I then spent the next couple of days creating the website we were going to look at. Looking at Marge, I asked, You broke up with him on Thursday, didn't you? Disdaining me, she laughed. You're crazy. There is no one but you. But now it can be. I opened Outlook on our 65-inch TV and clicked on one message and asked, Do you recognize this guy? His name is Will Perez. Marge's face turned pale, and she faintly whispered, No. He sent me a link to his website. You stand out there, noticeably. Turning to Julia and Tom, I said, It's time for you to go upstairs. Julia said, No. She got us into this. We're not leaving now. Tom simply remarked, Dad, I see the link address. If you send us upstairs, we'll be typing that address into my computer in five seconds. No one else offered an opinion, and Tom was probably the only person who would have read the link as a matter of course. He must have wondered why I was going to start a site called the Horsoff Perez. Nodding to the children, I clicked on the link. A blue screen flashed across the screen, and a deep male voice said, Welcome to the whores of Will Perez. Photos of fully clothed women began to appear on the screen as the voice continued. I want to share with the world the women I seduce. These are mostly married sluts who are easy to persuade into bed. I use hidden cameras to record everything they do. Marge gasped, perhaps feeling like her world was about to fall apart. The voice now hopefully sounded like Perez. I spent a lot of time converting the audio into his voice. Look at them. I have some videos and audio clips for each. If you like what you see, message me. I have high-definition video footage. For a small fee, they can be yours. And remember, 
These are hidden videos. These women have no idea I'm showing them to the world. All eyes were glued to the fourth image. It was Marge. She was wearing one of her usual work clothes, a gray pantsuit that suited her well. I hovered my mouse over her image, and we heard, Meet Marge A. She's in her mid-fifties, a little plump. I have a lot of videos of Marge. Click here to see and hear clips of Marge in action. Message me for a list of videos and prices. All heads turned to stare at Marge, who was pale and clenching her fists. Looking at the screen, she moaned, No, no, this cannot happen. No. Clicking on Marge's picture brought up a screen with eight clips of Marge. Marge's eyes widened when she saw the screen. Apparently, she recognized the place and perhaps some of her poses. She began to sob. Her mother hugged her. Her father looked stunned. Our children looked, to put it mildly, very angry. I walked away from the computer saying, I think we've seen enough. No, said Julia. I haven't yet. These little pictures could be anything. I want to know what the hell is going on, she continued angrily. I want to see the proof either way. At the same time, she rushed past me, grabbed the mouse and clicked on the first image. While the video clip was loading, Tom walked up to her and put his hand on her shoulder. She hugged him tightly. Oh my God, this is disgusting, Julia exclaimed in shock. How could you do this? Tom looked even more shocked, but didn't say anything. Marge was crying in her mother's arms at this time. Marge's father hugged his wife, and Marge just sobbed. After a few seconds, Julia clicked on the following link, and the video appeared. Marge's sobs grew louder. No one said a word when Julia clicked on the third link. When the video disappeared, I said, Julia, we've seen enough. She nodded and tears streamed down her face. She and her brother walked across the room to hug me again. Tom cried, as did Marge's parents. Marge cried uncontrollably in her mother's arms. After a minute, I asked, Marge, why? She started crying even harder, trying to answer. But all I could make out was, I don't know. I'm so sorry. God. Handing Tom the car keys, I said, Kids, go somewhere for a couple of hours. Go shopping if you want. Do you have credit cards but need cash? Tom replied, No, I took care of it. We'll have dinner and come back tonight. Julia said, I need to get my purse. I'll be right back. After they left, I said, I'll be back in 30 minutes. Marge, it would be nice if we could talk then. Looking at her parents, I added, it's better if you two stay too, please. She needs your help. Then I went for a long walk. I returned about 40 minutes later. Marge and her parents were sitting at the kitchen table. Marge immediately stood up and said, David, thanks for coming back. I nodded and said, please sit down. We have one more problem to discuss. Marge's face turned pale again. As she sat down, I noticed how red her eyes were. I sat across from her at a round table of four and said, Marge, Perez was arrested today. Her eyes widened again. George has been investigating irregularities in your office for a couple of months now. It turns out that Perez was deceiving the government and blackmailing his suppliers, demanding kickbacks. Three people just stared at me. Marge was crying hysterically again. I continued, his office, his business, and his love nest were ransacked today. In addition, one guy from your delivery department and one from your purchasing department were arrested. Standing up and walking over to Marge, I added, George has proof, your emails to Perez, where you leaked contract details and competitors' prices to him. Marge threw her head up and gasped, no, I would never do that. Her mother snapped. How can we believe that? Marge was sobbing. The only reason you are not in prison right now is because you are, at least for now, my wife. George is breaking the rules. But if you are not in his office tomorrow morning, they will escort you there. Standing in front of her, I said, Marge, if you did this, you will be sent to federal prison for a long time. 
she screamed. I didn't say that. I know you have no reason to believe me, but I didn't leak any work information to him. She looked into my eyes and admitted, Yes, I lied to you. Yes, I had an affair with him, and he gave me diseases. And what's worse, I tried to frame you to cover up what I did. I can't expect you to forgive me or want to be with me. And if I had sent Will any information, prison would have been a good place for me. I had nothing left anyway, but I didn't. I asked, Marge, have you ever taken your laptop into his love nest? She nodded. A couple of times, it allowed me to work, while still having the day off. I am so sorry. I shouted, day off so you can cheat. Grimacing, she nodded. Marge, has he ever had access to your laptop? Have you ever finished with him and then go take a shower or fall asleep while you were connected to the base network? She nodded again without looking at me. I grabbed her laptop and quickly turned it on. Then I turned off our internet. I needed to do this because one of the last things I did after gaining remote access to Marge's computer was to schedule a mass email to make it look like Perez had done it. With the internet down, the letters couldn't be sent, but here was another crime to pin the blame on Perez. I pretended to be surprised when the password was needed and asked her to tell me. After a short pause, I looked at her and said, Marge, he installed a remote control program on your computer so he could control it and see everything. There's an entrance there for Perez. Her head shot up, shocked again. He set me up, she cried. Naughty, I said. Yeah, it looks like he wanted more from you than just your body. Pretending to ignore her reaction to this, I leaned towards her laptop. I waited a moment and then straightened up and looked at Marge. It's good that I turned off the internet. There is a scheduled task to send his email to all your contacts, I told her. To family, friends, work colleagues, church, everyone. You broke up with him on Thursday, and this is his way of getting revenge. Marge completely collapsed, and her mother hugged her again. But it might be enough to keep you free. All three of them stared at me, so I added, This shows that he had remote access to your computer, and could use it to obtain confidential information. Now George thinks you sent Perez those documents. This shows that Perez could do it, and this website logs IP addresses. If you're not lying, Marge, he will show that Perez was logging into your computer at the time your emails were sent to him. This may justify you. Another part of my revenge was that I installed camera software on Perez's computer and copied all the video files to his hard drive. It now appeared that the videos were his, making them admissible in court. And since it now appeared that the videos were his, they were admitted into evidence. Perez found himself in more trouble than he could have imagined. I also sent audio files of his blackmail efforts to his computer. George could have used them too. A few months later, after Perez's last criminal conviction, he was convicted for theft, fraud, extortion, and racketeering. On the day he entered prison, the Internal Revenue Service and state tax authorities notified Perez that they were looking for lost taxes on bribes he received and were also auditing his companies. On his second day in prison, his wife filed for divorce. A week later, George and I were sitting in the bar where Mary no longer worked. Her new job in base procurement allowed her to leave the bar and enroll in medical school for night classes. I reminded George that I needed to find out how much I owed him for his recording devices that I had donated to Perez. He promised he would, and then, smiling broadly, added, Besides, you and I spent dollar one, five hundred each yesterday. Great for us, I replied. This gin and tonic isn't as good as the one Mary made, but it's still good. At that moment Mike entered the bar. He looked terrible when he approached us. I ordered a new round of drinks. The new barmaid made better gin and tonics. I expected Mike to show up tonight. I told him where I would be. This afternoon, with regret, I gave him a copy of the file where our wives talked about their infidelities and told him about what happened between Marge and me. Mike took a sip of gin and then turned to George. 
George, I'd like to rent some official equipment. And so it all started again.